This is a uh, part three of a, uh, a 10 to 20 part series yet. I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but God willing, we're going to figure it out together. Thank you so much. Baruch atah Adonai. Eloheinu melech ha'olam. Shehakol nihiyah bidvaro. Tonight's class is dedicated to our holy brothers and sister in Israel who are standing at the borders waiting and ready to go and to do what they got to do to find those that were taken captive. It should also be a schut for all those that were taken captive. They should be free from harm and they should be healthy and reunite with their families soon. Okay, um, we are talking about positive thinking. Uh, the truth is that this topic we started at the end of the summer. And um, as, uh, you know, we had the holidays, we had, uh, we had some get in the zones in between, we really didn't have a chance to continue this topic, uh, but um, restarting it and having spent the last couple of weeks uh, reading the news and seeing what's happening in New York and, and around uh, on campus and being on campus and so on and so forth, um, I, I need this class, I think, more than you do. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm happy that we're doing this. Um, if you want to catch up on the first two classes, which is more of the introduction, you can find them on YouTube. Um, I, I, I post the uh, class, uh, the recordings afterwards. I typically don't do it for other classes, but I feel like this class and the subject matter is important enough for me to want to do it. So uh, it's out there. And if anyone wants uh, you know, soft copies of these, uh, all the sheets and all the sources, I'm happy to send them to you as well. Okay, the power of speech. Um, this topic is, is one that you're all familiar with. The idea that uh, words um, create, define our reality is not a new concept to you. But it's one thing to know something intellectually, it's a whole other thing to internalize it in your heart. The Gemara in Shabbat tells us that the world exists in the merit of the words, of the, of the words uttered by little children, studying Torah. That little children, their little words of them saying Tehillim, they're reading Bereshit, all the, word, all the things that they do, they somehow have an impact on the world. What does the Gemara explain the words uttered? It means that every one of their words sustains the world. This is a, this is a very deep, deep rooted idea within Judaism, that, that the existence of reality is very much an expression of the words that we use. We say that a person's words impact and maintain the physical reality. That's what this class is going to be about, in a nutshell. We believe that what you say matters. So, for example, I, I get this all the time from girls. Rabbi, there, just, there aren't any guys out there. There are no good guys out there. Your words define your reality. I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want, because it's, it's not true. There are some great guys out there, Okay. There aren't any good guys out there. It's not the same. It's the same. Your, your words define your reality. Okay? What you say matters. Because your words create a truth in your thoughts. They create a, a particular type of boundary in your mind, and they help shape your reality. So there are several different functions of thoughts. Thoughts are the power of imagination. That's the creativity. And thoughts are the power of speech. And your speech has the power of manifesting your reality. We believe that there's something called mazalot. If you were here last summer with us, we had 13 classes on mazal and how that works. And one of the main takeaways that we spoke of is that the mazal that you were born with does not define you, it influences you. And your choices have the power of breaking out of your mazal. What you do with what you have will impact your reality. And therefore, in the same way that mazal has an impact, you know, the time, place you were born, okay, the same is true with your thoughts. Some of you, I don't know, I don't know uh, there's a lot of new faces here, I, I mean, I have six children. Um, uh, Baruch, Baruch Hashem, my oldest is 24, my youngest is, she's seven, but she's like, she's 30. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, each one of my children are uniquely different. I mean, very different. Those of you that have been to my home can attest to that. They're all very different. Um, and each of them have a particular, I would call it like a, a software that they were born with. A certain type of thinking. You know, uh, some of them are more uh, outspoken. Some of them are more articulate. Some of them are more, you know, negative. Some of them are more positive, too positive, too negative. All kinds of things in the middle. You know, we, don't, we, we have, we have big families, you know that different people, uh, you know, uh, have a different type of a, of a makeup. But there's one thing that's, that's true. 
you know, I'll tell you, true, this is a true story. This happened, uh, I believe, on, um, when was it? It was on Arab Shabbat. Uh, between, it was, on, it was Arab Shabbat before Yom Kippur. And I remember it was like right before Shabbat, we, got a, uh, we, had an, we had an oven in our house that broke and we had to get a new oven and these new ovens are all electric and they're very particular type of timers. The timer on my oven is a separate device you have to buy that's kosher by the OU and all these other hashkachot on it. And it has its own electric you know, guidance for the oven. And if I don't set the timer on time, okay, you, it just says idle and you're, 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 you can't get your oven to work for Shabbat. Now, food is very important in my home. I'm sure it is as it is in your house, okay? So if you can't get the oven right on, you don't get the hot food for Shabbat, it's, it's, a, it's a big pain. And my, my wife also, she likes to make her chita and her chamin in the oven. She has like a cast iron thing. Like for her, the oven is very important. So anyway, it's before Shabbat. I come downstairs and it says Shabbat idle, which means I can't, pre, I can't touch the oven. I can't set it. I can't change it. It's stuck. There's like a half hour before Shabbat comes in, and, and for me, I know what that means. It means someone was trying to program the oven, and they got it wrong, and they just shut the timer off. I couldn't use it. I blew a gasket. I'm like, who touched the oven? Who, who? I was just like, I was so upset. I was so angry, because I know, because my wife's going to be frustrated and angry. So I was already feeling like, you know, why would you get this kind of an oven? I hate this oven. This is not a good oven. Why would you do this? And like, all that stuff is going through my head, and I'm really frustrated, and I realized that like, I, I was just like, I'm like, I'm just so angry because someone did this. Anyway, Kitsur is that I'm, I'm calming down, I'm walking to my Knesset, and I'm really upset at myself for exploding the way I did. Because that's not who I want to be. I don't want to be the angry guy that gets upset about Shabbat idle modes on ovens. I don't want to be the guy that gets like, I'm, I'm, I could be bigger than that. So, um, you know, I, I, I calm myself down as I'm walking. It was too late already because the damage was done. I blew up already. I allowed my words to come out. I allowed my emotions, everything. It was like a perfect storm right before Shabbat. All that pressure, you're trying to get ready. Everything is happening at once. It's just like the last thing you got to do is to get it right, and it goes wrong, right? Um, and I realized that, you know, sometimes I, the, the, the mode is set up that if you don't set the oven on time, like close enough to Shabbat, it'll just automatically assume that you're not using it and go into Shabbat idle mode on its own. So it's very possible that no one touched it and I, 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 was, I wasn't down the cup's food. Even though I still believe someone touched it, but in my mind, I'm assuming that, you know, I gotta be down the cup's food and, <laughs> and nobody touched it. So I, I, um, I come back home, all right, and I'm standing there, we, we finish singing Shalom Aleichem, I'm about to make Kiddush. And instead of making Kiddush, I said, I just wanna, I wanna apologize to everyone at the house and my family said, you know, that what you saw me doing earlier today is not who I want to be. I don't want to be an angry guy that screams about and is upset about idle modes not activating on Shabbat and so on. So that's not who I want to be. And it wasn't enough for me to think it. I had to articulate it, and I wanted my family to hear it because I wanted it to be real. Your words impact your world in, in, in many more ways you could possibly imagine. We saw what happened this past week with words you know, one group says that the hospital was hit, it wasn't hit, and we saw it happen immediately. Within an hour, we had people going out there, marching in the streets, blood libels, and so on. So it's crazy. Words matter. They shape reality. How people speak, what they do, what they don't do, it matters. It matters so much, by the way, that people are upset that there are signs of babies who that's had kidnapped on them, that they can't, they can't handle reading those words, they have to tear it down. It bothers them. They don't want that to be, to be their reality. They want a different reality. They want to ignore reality. That's a whole other conversation. But we know that if you look in Bereshit, right, it says that God, Hashem Elohim, Adam, I'm number three. God blew a spirit of life into man. Targum Unkel says, what is it? He says, right? God put a, uh, a man became a living being, he became a speaking spirit. What does it mean to be a human being? Rashi says at the end of there, he says because to him it was granted understanding and speech to be a human being, to have the spirit of God in you means that you have a mind to reason and the power of communication. That's what it means to be a human being. And therefore the way in which you use your words, by the way, the place where you're challenged the most with your words, to know, if, you, if you really want to know if you're doing a good job, you know where it is? It's between you and your mom. Because somehow our mothers, I'm not sure if it's just a Jewish mom thing or it's an all mom thing, I imagine it's all moms, they know how to choose the most perfectly crafted words. They're perfect words. 
And I don't know why they, how they do this, but they use certain kinds of words and somehow it gets under your skin. It's a, it's a sentence, it's a tone, it's one word sometimes, it's not even, it's just the hello, oh, why did you say hello like that? <laughs> what do you mean by that hello? <laughs> right, the little, little things, <coughs> and they somehow trigger us. And it's all in your head. You're allowing your own mind to create a fictitious reality between you and your parents. But Rashi says that what does it mean to be a human being? To be a human being means your power of speech. That's what it means to be created in the Spirit of God. To be created in the Spirit of God means that you have the ability to communicate. Noam Chomsky, not someone who I love quoting, but I will quote him today. He says that the ability to speak is embedded in our genes and derives from the brain. A person's ability to expand his vocabulary is likewise rooted in the brain and is distinctly a human trait. Therefore, your speech is everything. The more you're able to articulate, the more you're able to communicate, the more you're able to express, helps expand your world. I often say that the power of your questions is a deep expression of the quality of your life. The quality of your questions impacts the quality of your life because if you could ask and speak and think, it has an impact on your reality, on your world. What's the difference between speech and action? We all know, right? Action speaks louder than words. So why is it that we often look at action more so than words? Do you ever wonder that? Why? And the, I think the answer is because actions are things that are measurable. I can see that, hey, you know, you're doing this and you're doing that. I can measure that. I can understand what you're doing there. But what's a word? Big deal. You said that. Show me. But imagine, and we, by the way, the reason why we, we want action is because we don't live in a world where words actually have meaning. Because you could have people, uh, you know, in, uh, in the press saying all kinds of things, and it's meaningless. There's nothing behind it. No value there. Parents, I see this all the time, parents make empty threats. Oh, if you do this, I'm going to take that, and they don't do it. Words have to have consequences. They have a deep impact, not only on the people around you, but most importantly on you. And therefore, since there's no way to measure the result of words, we don't take them seriously, but we should. Because we saw this past week how a few words, how much harm they caused to so many people around the world. A few words. And by the way, I'm not excusing Israel. You know, Israel, when this whole thing started, said a bunch of things that were just dumb. You know, we're going we're gonna to flan Gaza. We're gonna, they're inhumane animals. Like you, you, there's certain things you could think it, but don't say it. You know, because it, it, it has a negative impact. It doesn't help the cause. How you say what you say is so important on so many different levels. So there's a, there's a uh, I often quoted this, uh, Dr. Masuru Umoto, who is a, uh, he wrote a uh, article called, or book actually called The Hidden Message in Water. And you've sure have seen this before because we've spoken about it. The idea that he took water and he measured water crystals and he, he put positive words on it. And the positive words had a had positive impact. A uh, positive structure of the crystal. If you want, you could Google it. You could actually see the crystals. Fascinating. You know, he took negative words like hate, war, and the crystals along the water kind of aligned themselves in a discombobulated, in, in a, in a, 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 a non-symmetrical way, right? But your positive words somehow create symmetry and beauty and perfection in the crystals. And he's, his whole point of his whole experiment is that the words matter. Columbia University did a study. <coughs> excuse me, in, in 2002 and 2003 with people that were sick. And they took these 60 patients, 30 of whom that they were praying for and 30 who were not praying for. And it, was a, it wasn't a massive difference, but the, the people, the 30 people that were prayed for had a 30% higher chance of recovering faster than people who were not prayed for. What does that mean exactly? I don't, I don't know how to measure any of that. But imagine how positive words have the power of impacting your physical reality and and, 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 and not only on, on, a, uh, on a material level, but even on a, on a human level, that when you're actually saying your tehillim, you think you're just saying words, you're not just saying words. Your tehillim have the power of actually creating something, a force in the world, okay, that has the power of impacting someone. When you say someone's name, I'm saying this for refuah shleima, for chana sima bat bega, right? I want, I, want, I want her to have a refuah. It matters. 
You don't believe in your words, but they, they, I'm telling you, your words have tremendous ability of actually shaping reality. And this guy, Dr. Emoto, he did the same thing. He proved it. There's another guy in the bottom of there, number nine. You know, this guy, Tomer Raviv, who is a, uh, an Israeli student of Bar Ilan, who did a similar experiment with, uh, with beans, and he did positive words, negative words, positive words, the beans grew differently versus the negative words. Chazan Ish says, one of the mysteries of creation is that a person's thought can trigger unknown forces in the physical world. What's he talking about? What are these unknown forces in the physical world? You may have seen the story of uh, one of the survivors from October 7th who uh, told the story about how he saw what was happening. He ran into his, uh, his ma'amid and he closed the door. Him and his son got a gun and he told the son every single time you see a, uh, you hear someone speaking Arabic, shoot two, two bullets from your little, uh, the little slot in the window and I'll shoot two bullets from the little hole in front of the door. And every single time we shoot two bullets, we're each going to say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Lekeir Hashem Echad. They did this for two and a half hours. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. For two and a half hours, meditating non-stop. Shooting their bullets and saying Shema. Shooting their bullets and saying Shema. Right? They survived. Okay? I don't know how that stuff works. I'm not, I can't tell you that every single, if you say Shema Yisrael all the time, it's going to protect you from everything. You're going to become invisible. That's not what I'm saying. Right? I'm saying that there's something about the way in which we think that impacts our world. I have a daughter um, who is a, um, we call her, we say she has a ruach, we, her, her name is Rachel, we, call, she said, she say, we, we say that she has a ruach Rachel, right? That there's something always, she somehow always is always spilling cups, she's always dropping things, she just, you know, she just makes a mess all the time. You know, she's a fun kid, but somehow she always draws attention to her. Right? And it's, it's, it has so much to do with how she thinks and how she speaks about her reality. Even when it's a joke, it impacts her. So as a parent, my job is to help kind of like reframe her own thinking and help her see bigger that she's got to stop the negative thoughts and start thinking positively. Right? It, it, and it, I'm telling you, I've seen a massive change in her. The Ruach Rachel is slowly dissipating and moving away. Right? Because it's, it's all in your head. It's all in your head. There is no one in the world that can impact you negatively unless God wants it to happen. Right? Just, that's just the nature of things. The reality is, is that we believe in Bore Olam. We say it to be an Ish, right? It means Ein Yiyush Ba'olam. There is, there, is no, there is no Yiyush. There is no, there is no, there is no ability. Right? Ein Yiyush. There is no, there is no I concept in Judaism of giving up hope. To give up hope means not to be a Jew. Who was more hopeful than us? Think about it for a minute. Who, who gave more expressions of hope than our people? Think about where every single person in this room came from. Your family, your ancestors, your grandparents, your great parents. Think about the challenge they had in their world, and they still made it here. We're telling a story for 3,300 years of Jewish survival. There is no time in history where it was easy we have it pretty good, considering all things. We shouldn't have to see any more suffering in the world for anybody. But God is trying to create a reality where each of us are able to ascend to become something more than what we are. You don't think he wants to give you everything that you want? Of course he does. Which father does want to give their child everything? Of course he does. But it would be irresponsible to give you something if you're unable to receive it. How are you upgrading where you're at? The world changed very quickly. It was only a few weeks ago where Israel was literally at the brink of civil war, where Jews hated each other. Chiloni, Dati, it, 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 it was horrible. And now you see these heartwarming pictures of like, you know, a guy with payas and, a, <laughs> and this leftist, you know, a secular Israeli standing together in a soup kitchen. The whole world changed in an instant. We've, we, we all were able to see how in, within a few hours, how the whole entire Jewish world could change, how the whole, all of reality can change. If reality around us can change so quickly, are we able to change internally just as quickly? Because if you don't allow the shift to happen within you, if, you don't, if you're not able to change the way you're thinking, this particular uh, attack on our people as painful as the imagery and the videos and all that stuff is, it's really an attack on our minds. 
it's, it's, it's an attack on your emunah. I, I wasn't here for Rabbi Hajjaf's uh, speech, but he's, I'm sure he's talking about Amalek, right? The idea of safek and all that, I get it, right? But, okay, nice to know, but now what do I do with it? Okay, so it's, these, these people are trying to destroy me, and it's really bad, and they create safek. Well, what, what, what's my tikkun? The tikkun is, wh- what are you allowing to get into your head? Who's in control of what you're seeing? Unfiltered? I can see whatever I want, I'm okay. I'll, I'll, it's, not, it's not okay, there's certain things that should not be seen. There's certain things that should not be heard. I'm not saying you should be ignorant. I'm just saying that what, what you allow to enter into your mind, the way in which you allow things to enter into your mind has an impact on the way you see your world. The way you see your world has an impact on your speech, and the speech stuff is real, my friends. It's not fake. So much so that it impacts the physical world around you. So Chazanish says that a person's thoughts trigger unknown force in the physical world. So let's see what he says. He says, Mm -hmm. says that the world was created through ten utterances, through speech. Moed Katan says that Sadiq decrees and the Kaddish Baruch Hu fulfills. There was an old man that I met in Matisdorf about 30 years ago. He never spoke Lashon Hara, right? And they said anything this man said came true. Sadiq. Why? Because if your mouths are tahor, if they're holy, if your mouths, if you're someone that actually is careful about what they say, and you believe there's a God that created the world with speech, then you become godly. And therefore, as this Gemara says, Tzaddik decrees, the Kaddish Baruch Hu fulfills it. That's just the way it is. That's why we go to, a, we go to Tzaddik to get a bracha. And the Gemara tells us that the dream that you have, the interpretation depends on who? On the mouth, on how people interpret them. Right? Don't go to someone who's going to give you a negative interpretation. And the Yakut Shimoni quotes a story of Rabbi Eliezer, who had this woman come to her and said she had a dream about a beam breaking in her house, and twice she came to him and she told him, don't worry about it, you're going to have a baby. He wasn't there the third time, and the student said, what was your dream? Oh, yeah? It means your husband's going to die. Kachaya. Words shape your reality. The way you think and the way you speak matters. There are 24 interp- interpreters of dreams in Jerusalem. Once a certain person dreamt the dream, he went around to all of them to interpret each one of them for him in fulfillment of what was stated. All dreams follow the mouth. He knew which person to ask for which dreams because that's the interpretation he wanted. You want a good interpretation for your dream? You call me, I'll give you a good interpretation for your dream. I'll make sure it's great. Moed Katan, a covenant is decreed on one's lips. A person should never allow derogatory words to escape his lips. What, this, 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 these are the words of the Chachamim. They're telling you, my friends, hey, wake up. Your words have the ability of impacting your world. And we see this, by the way, most expressed, I think, there's two times you see it, but one, and this one is Rachel, Likcha Atrafim. Right, we know the story of uh, Rachel Imenu taking the uh, idols of uh, Lavan, her father, and uh, you know, he's furious and he comes out and, 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 and uh, Lavan approaches Yaakov, accusing him. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, whoever has them should be cursed. And Rashi over there says that, you know what? Uh, Tadik's words matter. And where does Rachel die? She dies on the way. She dies in childbirth. She, not, she doesn't see Benjamin grow up. Doesn't get to raise Yosef. Her own husband's words had a negative impact on her. Words matter. My mom is so annoying. You know, whatever the, those words are, right? Don't say them. Don't, don't say negative things. Don't allow that to shape your reality. No one's perfect. Perfection is an illusion. Everyone has struggles. Everyone has things they have to overcome. Everyone is going through something. No one's perfect. You have a choice to make. How am I going to go ahead and accept the circumstances that I am in? I'm going to embrace my world. I'm going to embrace my set of circumstances, okay? Because I, I didn't choose them. These are the circumstances that, I, that were given to me, right? But what makes me human is the ability to choose how I'm going to express, how I'm going to choose to express myself in the situation that I am in. I can give you stories and stories of stories, the story of a school teacher who had this annoying parent that came in who was upset at her for you know, giving an unfair grade to her, uh, her student, right? 
and you know she was they're both a deadlock. You know, deserves it, doesn't deserve it, doesn't deserve it. And um, this teacher goes home and says, you know what? I feel bad for the parent. I feel bad for the kid. I really wish that you know I don't want to fight with them. Just just reframing everything. Some people hold on to the negativity. Oh, that kid, that mother, chutzpah. You tell your friend, do you, do you believe that mother had the audacity to come to me and complain about the grade and you keep getting into it over and over again, just digging in deeper and deeper, making that your reality? And instead, what does this person do? She says, you know, I flipped the script and I decided that I'm going to pray for the mother and pray for the kid to get better grades and I pray for the mom to see that I made, I made the right choice. The mom called her the next day to apologize. How many times did that happen? I was, I was in a bad mood, I'm so sorry, you know, you didn't deserve that, whatever, let's work together to make sure my kid gets a better grade. How can I help them? You choose. Can I prove that that's how it works? I can't prove anything. I'm telling you the Masorah that we have. The Masorah that we have is that the way you think, the words that you use, matters. How are you thinking through these times right now? Are you thinking about the worst things that can happen? Or are you thinking about all the best things that can happen? The story of Rabbi Kiva up there with the Tanaim, with the Beit HaMikdash, they're all crying and he's laughing. What's that? That's right. We are, we, are the, we are believers and the children of believers. Right? It's, 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 it's up to you. You decide. You decide what this world looks like. Sefer Zohar. There's no speech that issues from a person's mouth that does not have a voice. That voice derives from on high, and many angels of destruction can attach themselves to it. Api Kabbalah, everything that happens in the physical world is an expression that something that is happening on a spiritual plane. This physical world, this lectern, right, is here because there's some kind of, there's a spiritual place above, and it is giving energy to this thing to be alive. The nexus between the physical world and the spiritual world, the spiritual world are words. That's why the most powerful thing in the world you have is tefillah. How many of you have said the word matir asurim with different type of kavana in the morning? Right? How many of you have found different words in the tefillah that have so much different meaning because of what's going on right now? You've said the words all the time. Do they really matter? No. Maybe not, maybe not as much now as they did before. But words are powerful. The chachamim knew what they were talking about. We never experienced captives. Shabu banim. We want all of them to come back home. I want every single one of them to come back home. But when you're thinking negatively, you allow negative malachim to attach themselves to your words for your words to become true. This is also why, by the way, I'm a very big believer, this is my Mesorah, that you should never go to Mikubal and ask him for any advice about what, should, what you should or should not do. And the reason for this, I heard this from Rav Yaakov Hillel, Rav Yaakov Hillel told me this. If you want, you could see it in his book called Tamim Tihiyah. They have a translation of it in English. He says that any time someone says something, they're, they're drawing something from a spiritual plane and bringing it into a physical plane. And when you're drawing something down to a physical plane, we no longer have the ability of protecting what is said from negative forces. And therefore, when you're pulling it down, know that it could be impacted by negative things, and therefore you don't want to touch it. That's, that's what the Sohar is saying over here. A person should... Al tiftach satan. Yeah, question. Well, I really believe that every person is born with a name. And your parents had uh, what we call mini Ruach HaKodesh when they named you, and that's your name. Don't change it. Don't add names to your names either. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I, I, when people tell me their name, I, that's their name. When I write a ketubah, what's your name? I'm not, oh, this, that name must be the Hebrew version of it, must be this. I don't do that at all. Your name is your name. That's your name. What people call you is your name. Yeah. Yeah, so that, again, that's api kabbalah, right? That, you know, if you're, 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 there are certain numerical values to names and so on and so forth. I'm not a mikubal at all, and that's not what I, I I'm, I'm just a big believer in that your name is your name. You know, if you have a, someone like Rav Chaim Kanievsky saying, well, listen, you know, I'm an expert in nameology, and, uh, you know, I think that that name is, uh, there's a better name suited for you. He has a deeper insight spiritually, then go for it. I don't think most people can tell you what, their, what a name is. You know, and if I could just go ahead and draw it on a sheet of paper and then do the number game, that's what they play. And I say, well, based on the numbers, it doesn't work like that. Rochaim Kanievsky is a spiritual master. 
And he gets special spiritual insight because of all of his spiritual focus and energy, his ability to be focused and disciplined on having a, a, a mind that is focused, having a mouth that is super disciplined. He could say that, and he could shape reality. For example, I'll give you an example. Ready? We know the Gemara in Berachot says there's something called Shedim. Right? It's very clear. There are negative forces. There are demons in the world. However, Harambam says no such thing. There are no demons. They don't exist. So the, the Rambam is a, uh, a Rishon. The Gemara is the Gemara, the Tanaim, right? We know how these things goes with a hierarchy of, uh, of uh, ideals. And then the Shulchan Aruch says, well, how could, how could the Rambam say there's no Shedim when the Gemara clearly says there are Shedim? So, you know, they curse the philosophy that he learned. But there are others that say, well, it's very simple. When the Rambam said there are no Shedim, they stopped existing. Because that was the Rambam. When you're a Tzaddik, your words shape reality. And for him and his generation, it didn't exist. It wasn't there anymore. How we understand that, I don't know. But I could hear that. I could hear that in each generation, the people of that generation shape their reality. Our minds, our thoughts shape our reality. You are where you are because that's your, your, that you're shaping your reality. And therefore we say, Al tiftach tel satan. Don't open your mouth to the satan. Don't say it. And instead of saying, Bli ayin hara, stop saying that. Don't say bli ayin hara. I'm against it. Why? Because you're, you're giving power to the ayin hara. You know what you should be saying instead? Baruch Hashem. Todah la'el. Inshallah. Say, <laughs> say whatever you got to say. But don't say, <laughs> don't say <coughs> bli ayin hara. Forget about bli ayin hara. You don't worry about the ayin hara. Don't worry about the satan. Focus on the good things. We have enough negative things to worry about in our lives. Take any negativity out of your life. Take it out of the vocabulary. I am going to choose to be someone that wants to live a life of positivity. I am someone that believes that everything happens, the kap tov, everything is good. Everything around me is an expression of God's love. Do I fully understand it? The answer is no. I don't fully understand it. You know, so I'm not sure if you saw that. There was like a short clip that was going around from, from a while ago about Jonathan Sachs. Someone asked him about evil in the world, right? And they said to him, well, how do you understand evil in the world? He's like, you know, uh, I, didn't have a qu- I didn't have the answer to that question before, but after 20 years of thinking of it, I'll tell you my answer. This is his answer, and I love this answer. He said that if we were to understand the nature of evil, we would never want to stomp it out because it's, it makes sense to evil. Evil has to be something that disturbs us. It has to bother you. It's supposed to activate you. It's supposed to motivate you. It's supposed to get you inspired to go out and stomp it out and destroy it. We're not meant to understand the evil. But if you recognize that everything is from God, if you truly recognize and believe that the whole entire world around you is an expression of Hashem's ratzon, right? Don't worry about the negativity. It's all good. There are no better parents that can raise you. There's no other time in history that you could have been born in. There are no other set of circumstances that could have got you to exactly to where you are right now. Like Viktor Frankl said, the one thing that you can control, the one thing the Nazis cannot take away from a person is their ability to respond to their circumstance. That's it. That's all you have. Choose. How do you want this year to be? It started, it's a very, very intense start, <laughs> right? I was hoping this year was going to be a nice, fun year. We're going to have a lot of fun together. We're going to do cool things. It's so intense. <laughs> I can never, never imagine a year like this. Okay, Sheba Shmuel, number 21. There are four elements in the universe, earth, wind, fire, and water. In Kabbalistic approach, earth is the element that represents the attributes of asiya, of action. Despite the fact that earth represents action, it cannot take action on its own. The first letters of the other three elements are as, ish, maim, and ruach. What does that spell? Amar, to say. Speaking activates the elements, enabling them to be useful in the world. When a person opens his mouth to saying something, he exhales his breath, which is warm, to express the words. This is the element of fire. In his mouth, it's moisture, with a saliva, which expels along with the breath, and he speaks. It's the element of water. The exhaling he does as he pronounces the word is the element of wind. These three elements comprise a person's speech, which is why the three represent the attribute of action. Amira is impacts the world. You've seen those experiments when you were in elementary school, the earth science class, when you play positive music with your plants, right, they grow differently. 
and the negative music impacts them negatively. You know this stuff, but do you live it? Are you ready to transform yourselves? The Gemara Megillah says, do not let the blessing of even a simple person be trivial in your eyes. Right? These are important people. If you, someone says something positive, jump on it. Anytime someone says something positive in your world, make sure you are letting them know how grateful you are for their positivity. What kind of a person do you want to be? How do you want to respond to your environment? Do you want to be the sad, crying person that always sees negativity? Very simple. Allow the negativity to bubble up in you. It'll define you. And it'll draw more negativity, God forbid, to you. But if you're the kind of person that makes that switch, there's a Holocaust survivor who decided in Auschwitz that he was not going to allow himself to be and to be negative. He was only going to be positive. And therefore, he went out of his way to always be helpful. If anyone needed, if the Nazis ever needed a volunteer, he always volunteered. If someone in the bunk needed something to be done, he always he was going to be the, the mitzvah person that was always going to do something positive. To the point where, when the Germans had to make their quote of who they were throwing out to gas, they never chose him. They liked him because he was a positive person. It's a choice to make how you're going to respond to the situation that you're in. You could allow yourself to be flooded with the negative emotions, the fear, or you could say, no, I'm going to be a force for good and everything that I choose will always be positive and good. Your choice. What's that? Exactly, like that. Like I actually haven't seen it. I've only heard people, I've heard all the women talk to me about how, how brilliant Rachel was with her cookies and how she stole the Hamas uh, uh, terrorists in her house for 20 hours. Um, but, um, you know, uh, the story is that there was a, uh, there was a uh, woman named Rachel. I, I, does everyone know the story? Yeah. Okay, anyway, in a nutshell, if you're watching this, you know the story. I don't know her last name, but there was a, I believe she was, I think she was, what's that? Her last name is Edry? So she's either Moroccan or Iraqi, but she was for sure Sephardic. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she's Persian? Okay, fine, she's Persian. All right, even better. So uh, she knew, she had this art of a femininity, and she had this deep understanding of human psychology, and she was uh, positive, and she helped uh, band-aid, bandage the, uh, one of the terrorists. She made them food, she took care of them in the house. Like, she's total positive. And it reframed the whole entire, that whole entire episode with them. And she stole them long enough for her, her I imagine for her son or someone to come there and to neutralize them, right? Genius, genius. You could either just freak out and just like cry and not do anything, or you could stand up and say, no, I'm going to be bigger in the situation that I'm in. It changed the reality that she was in. She commanded that whole moment because she chose to be positive. She chose to see how she could turn a situation that was dark, gloomy, and broken into something profoundly good. And you're always rewarded for doing good. Okay, I'm almost finished. <laughs> I'm almost finished. <laughs> it says, Mavet chayim biyad lashon. Death and life and the power of the tongue. Right, the famous story of... Uh, of um, Ben Yoyada, Ben Ishchai, right? This is the, uh, the, uh, the advisor of Shlomo Melech who went out to get the, uh, the, blood, the, the milk of a, uh, of a lion to go ahead and save uh, a king who had a particular kind of disease. You know the story? And then, you know, he, uh, he finally gets the milk and he's able to go ahead and deliver it to the king and he has his dream on the way there and all the different body parts are fighting about which organ in the body is the strongest and either the legs say it's me, the arms say it's me, the eyes say it's me, and the tongue says it's me and you'll see, watch. They get to the king's palace, and uh, he's about to present this uh, milk of the, uh, the lion to the king, and he says, no, it's the, it's, the mil it's the milk of a dog. And the king is so insulted. You told me you're going to get me lion's milk, even dog's milk, throw him in the dungeon. He's going to be 24 hours, he's dead. So he uh, is put in prison, <coughs> and he's tired from a, a whole month of trying to get this milk. He falls asleep again, and, he, and all the uh, parts of the, the body are, are, are yelling at the tongue, what did you do, what did you do, what did you do? And he says, in the same way that I got you, I could save you, but you have to proclaim me as king. Right? The mouth rules. That's what Shlomo Melch taught us. Mavet chayim biyad lashon. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. So let's end with the uh, quote from Perkei Avot. <coughs> Shimon ben Amar. Kol yemei gadalti ben hahamim. My whole life, I grew up among the wise men. 
ולא מצאתי לגוף טוב אלא שתיקה. You don't have anything positive to say, then keep your mouth shut. And when you see people opening their mouths where they shouldn't, you know that they're very far from having any kind of chokhmah. Sometimes silence, you can't, you, okay, fine, I get it. You don't know how to speak positively, then just be quiet. I don't want to hear your negativity. I don't want to think about your negativity. Don't bring me negative. I don't want to know about it. I'm choosing to live a world of positivity. I'm choosing to, I'm choosing to use words that exp- I want you to know. I, mean, I, I didn't grow up with a very clean mouth. Okay? I swore like a drunk sailor every single minute I could. I loved it. <laughs> right? I loved it until I realized how bad it was. And it took me years to learn. Like schnitzel is a word that I often, I, I had to find other alternatives you know, that I could use you know, when I wanted to express certain types of things. I, I had to find other words like for crying out loud you know, or shut the front door. I would, I would find other things. I would say other things to like, I to repl- change my vocabulary because the world that I lived in was a, very, it was a very dark place because of my words that I chose to use. I chose to use words that were negative and it created a real negativity. It took me years to stop that, years. I don't expect you to go to one class and have to switch off, but it all starts with a choice. How do you want your mind to operate? Because all I've showed you in this very short talk is that your words impact your reality in many more ways than you could possibly imagine. And if you don't create a pause, a stop, if you don't create a space for you to kind of like make a change in the way you're speaking and thinking, it's your mind and your mouth that's going to create a reality that you're going to regret later. The limitations that you find yourself in is just an expression of your thoughts and your words. If you really believe that anything is possible, then anything will become possible. If you, if you really believe that there's something out there that's better, greater for you, waiting for you, then I'm telling you right now, the avodah of our generation is our words. Remember, this is tafshin peh, peh dalet. In the year, we left from tafshin ayin, right? Tafshin ayin was the, the last uh, 10 years, the last decade. That was all about the eyes. The internet was just starting. You know, it was all about the enayim. The tafshin peh is about our mouths. The year, the decade that we're in is about the avodah, is about our mouths. It's how we use our speech that defines our world. We've already lost the battle of our Ayanayim, right? Too many people have too many access to too many horrible things, which is why, part of the reason why they want to get into your heads. They want to get into your heads with their videos. They were so proud of what they did. They, want, they did it on purpose. They were instructed to do what they did on purpose because they wanted to get into your mind. Because if they get into your mind, they can actually control the way you speak. And I can control the way you speak, I can control your reality. There is no reason to be afraid. There's no fear. There's, there is no, there's nothing for you to worry about. At the end of the day, it's, it's all going to work out. It's all going to be great. But your story, how it unfolds, is not by chance. It's by design. And you know who the designers are? We are. So I'm begging you. I'm not asking you not to speak Lashon Hara, which I, I could easily say. Easy, don't speak Lashon Hara. Forget about Lashon Hara for a second, even before Lashon Hara. Right? Your words matter. Use your mouth for holy things. Choose to be a positive person. Choose to be down the Kaf We need it now more than ever. You want to find the Schuyot that change your world, know that the words that you use change your reality. When the Kohanim would go up to the, when you'd go up to the Beit HaMikdash, but Zerat Hashem soon will have the Beit HaMikdash, and when you're going to read the Karbanot, you'll see the Kohanim there getting ready to go ahead and offer your, your Korban. But before they would, you know what happened? The Leviim get up there, and they, start, they look at you, and look you in the eyes, and they say, okay, this guy or this girl, they need this nigun. They start singing a tune that is, that is, that is in the frequency of your soul so that you have the ability of going ahead and being completely present, so you can resonate with that moment in time and, and get whatever you need from that spiritual plane. Songs matter, words matter, the, the vibration of your mind matters. Choose to wire it the tov, and you will see more tov in your lives and Hashem in the world. Thank you so much for coming tonight. 
Bezrat Hashem, next week we're going to talk about thoughts. I have like a very, very interesting class on thoughts, and God willing, you know, we'll, we'll keep moving. Looking forward to continuing the subject over the next uh, weeks and months coming along. Does anyone have any questions before we end the night? Questions, comments, concerns? Is there any way to undo negative Yes. There is, there, is a way of doing, uh, there is a way of undoing negative speech. The way we undo negative speech is through working on positive speech. Right? If every th- word that you hear from somebody, by the way, this is a very good, very, very interesting insight. Ready? If you're, if you're, if you're friends, if you have a friend around you that is super negative, if everything you hear is always negative, stay away. Trust me, I know. I was born in New York. I was raised in New York. I, I get it. Right? I get it. I get it. But you have to be an agent for good. And uh, you choose. You choose the people you hang out with. You choose the things you want to hear. You choose the things you want to see. You choose it. You choose it. So number one is make sure you're surrounded by people that are positive. Uh, Number two is you make sure that when you have negative thoughts, you want to go ahead and change them for positive thoughts. Yeah. You can give constructive criticism that's positive, that has the same effect. Actually, it's, it's probably, it will be, well, it'll be better received if it's given through a positive you know, spin versus a negative spin. You can say the same thing, positive and negative, and you get, this, you get different, very different results. Right? But it depends on what you want to focus on. I don't want to focus on negativity. I want to focus on all the things that they do well and say, you can do this a little bit better. You know, that was great, but you know, if you change it like this, it's different than saying, well, that was really bad. Don't ever do that. You suck. You know, like that, uh, you shut down, you, the, you just, it doesn't work. But I find that, you know, um, all behavioral change can only happen through positive actions. That's a fact. Psychologically, that's a fact. You cannot, you cannot change any behavior through negative responses, only through positive responses. That's why I really feel like whatever's happening in Israel, it's like it's a loop. It's just a negative loop. It's just we're stuck. And until someone is willing to go ahead and make a positive change, sit down and come up with a real solution to the problem, it's, it's endless. But I'm hopeful that we're finally going to get beyond all of this and we're going to find a way to figure it all out. At the end of the day, remember that Israel made peace with Germany. How do they do that? It's impossible to have peace with the Palestinians. It's not impossible. It's all possible. It's just a question about, I'm telling you it's all possible. It's, as, as hard as it is to say it right now, I, I believe it's possible. I believe anything positive is possible. It just has, to, it has a lot to do with the will and the, uh, the, the mindset of our people. I'm not saying we're there right now, but I believe it's possible. You gotta try, you gotta start change somewhere. <laughs> Because I, I don't see how listening to everyone screaming at each other about the same things for 75 years, these are the words, 75 years, open prison, you know, uh, um, uh, occupied, oppressed, oppressor, you know, right, no right, I, I, I don't care. I don't care about the arguments. They're useless. They're not going to change anything. It's just, it's just more of focusing on, on, on pain and suffering and negativity. I would love to hear people offer real solutions. I would love to hear people say, you know what, this is what we got to do right now. But if, when, when we're only talking about who's right and who's wrong, and we're always, we're always saying everything we're hearing is coming from a negative, negative lens, it impacts you. I haven't slept properly in two weeks. I, I have, I'm, taking, I'm taking heartburn uh, medicine, I, it's not working. But the best thing, I just read the, I just read the uh, like little uh, label on the bottom, it says it may take one to four days for this thing to work. I'm like, <laughs> it wasn't fast acting. But anyway. The point is that Bezrat Hashem will work at the right time. All right, anyway, okay, any last, last question for the night? Yeah. So how will that be? How, how, could that happen? how can peace happen? Yeah. Um, I'll tell you how I think peace could happen. There's two ways I think peace could happen tomorrow. Yeah. One way is Mashiach comes. 
right? That's the easiest way for it to happen. Okay, we, the world gets a, a, uh, an awareness of a higher consciousness and a higher reality and says, guys, this is what we're going to do. Um, the other way it's going to happen is if um, we, uh, instead of focusing on everyone's gripes, um, we, we sit down with each other and create a space where we can not criticize one another, but we can actually hear each other out. I, I, I'm not saying, I'm not, I didn't say Hamas. I never said the word Hamas. I, I, I know. I'm saying Jews and Palestinians. I'm not saying Hamas. Not all Palestinians are Hamas. Okay. I, 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 we have to make that distinction. I don't believe. I don't believe that 2.2 million people in Gaza are all thinking the same thing. I, I, don't, I don't believe that. I, I think that uh, there are plenty of really good Arabs uh, that want to do the right thing, and that unfortunately they're stuck, and it's a difficult situation. You know, I could, I could put my mind in there. I could understand where they're coming from, right? Um, but um, again, it's, it's, just, it's the recognition that everyone really wants the same thing at the end of the day. Not the extreme parts of it. That, I believe, has to be destroyed and rooted and stomped out 100%. Right? No, I have no qualms with that. But at the core, I believe most people want to live a life that is meaningful and uh, there's, there's opportunity. I think everyone wants that. I can't imagine. Uh, that's where we got to start. Not from the negative spaces. Anyway, have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Get home safely. Thanks for coming. Yeah. What's up?